So welcome everybody to our panel on humanizing wealth holders and organizing wealth holders for the long term. Um, yeah, give it up. Um, let's please, do you mind showing the poll results? Let's just get a vibe check on the level of hope. There we go. Okay, we're feeling pretty hopeful. I'm excited there's that 3.45% of you here who are super skeptical. Welcome. <laughs> Very glad that you're here. I <laughs> see you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us in person and also online. I'm Iris Brilliant. I use she, her pronouns. And I am a coach for the wealthy, for the wealthy in particular who are interested in giving up some of their assets and redistributing wealth for social justice work. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here with my esteemed colleagues. We're all from the US. Uh, who I managed to convince to come here. Um, I just wanted to mention too, Michael Gast was supposed to be the moderator. Unfortunately, he has COVID, but he's here with us in spirit. Please check out his blog, Organize the Rich. Um, we're gonna be doing some anarchist style moderation. <laughs> so just roll with it with us, please. Um, and um, this is the part two of last year's panel, which was on the psychology of wealth. And we wanted to speak to why it is strategic and also makes your job less miserable when you're able to connect with the humanity of your wealthy clients um, and why that's really strategic and important for long-term organizing work. And when we talk about donor organizing, which we'll continue to follow up on in this panel, what we mean is moving away from a, a service for the wealthy, right? To make the wealthy feel better, to give away some money, to manage their money into bringing in a grassroots organizing approach, leadership development, campaign work, media strategy, investing in the leadership of the so-called enemies of social justice work, but a leadership that is not dominating, um, that's really building power with communities. And that is all I have to say. So without further ado, I would love for Vinny and then Rai to please introduce yourself. Who are you and what's your role in this, work, this very strange world of donor organizing? Thank you, Iris, for pulling us all together. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Is it still morning? Yeah. Yes. Technically. <laughs> We're slightly jet lagged, as you can imagine. Um, I'm Rajaswini or Vinny Bhansali. I'm the executive director of Solidaire Network, mm -hmm. which Thank you, Solidaire Love, yes. I thought people here wouldn't even know. Um, but we are a progressive network of donors, currently one of the largest in the US. Um, we're at around 360 members, 200 plus movement partners, and I'll speak more about how all of that works in a bit. But what brought me to Solidaire in the middle of um, the Trump era was watching the so the space for civil society closing and a global authoritarianism in the rise and becoming really clear after 30 years of social justice and movement building work that we really needed donors to be protagonists in this movement and in an unprecedented way at a scale that we haven't yet seen. Um, so that's what I'm here doing. I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in India and came to the US as a student um, and very much shaped by student organizing, which is why this moment feels vibrant and alive to me. And then shaped also by various um, movements for against colonialism, various forms of resistance that I've been part of over the decades and a big believer that when movements and the donors can get together and do things together. Uh, we can really exercise mutuality and interdependence in a way that the world really needs. Mm. Love it. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm some guy. My name is Rai. <laughs> uh, I go by he and they pronouns. I come from an organizing background. I got my start in philanthropy at a, at a small fund called Third Wave Fund, uh, which is a youth-led feminist gender justice fund. Yeah, yes, not for Third Wave. wave. Um, and since then, I've been um, largely doing donor organizing, and I really like um, the space between institutional foundations and individual donors. Um, I don't know that individual donors always know the extent to which they influence where foundations put their dollars. And so a lot of times I'm working with donors to 
understand all the different places where they have power and influence that they maybe didn't realize. Um, and then I like to work with foundations um, to support them in the way that they support social justice work. Um, and yeah, I also um, am a consultant and a coach and I have been in my consulting work um, co-pilot of a project called Grounded Giving. And that's been with me, Jo Lee, my collaborator. And that's been a project to support young people primarily with wealth who are just sort of new and starting their journeys out, um, who are dealing with overwhelm and we work to support them in finding their grounding in this world. Hmm. One other thing to note is Ryan, I also co-lead a cohort, adult children of rich, emotionally immature parents. <laughs> oh, Thought you I might enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I think the title says it all. Yeah. So over to you, Rye. Rye, you're now the moderator. Okay, so um, let the anarchy begin. <laughs> Humanizing wealth holders, um, we're gonna go through a few questions and pass it back and forth between the three of us. Um, so we believe that this can be a sort of weirdly controversial topic, humanizing people with wealth. Um, we often are used to phrases like eat the rich and not like heal the rich, right? Um, not organize the rich. So to get us going, I wanna just hear um, first from Vinny and then from Iris and then I'll weigh in also, just in what ways do you each hold the humanity of wealth holders in your work? And why is that strategic and important um, also, what happens when we do not, when we lose sight of the humanity of people with wealth? Yeah, we spend a lot of time thinking about this. So, Solidaire comes out of the Occupy movement in the United States 10 years ago. It was a moment of great movement uprisings all over the globe. But in particular, in the US, we were dealing with Standing Rock, we were dealing with um, an upsurge of the Black Lives Matter movement, Occupy Wall Street, a real moment of cultural consciousness around how the lives of the very rich were completely and intricately linked to the struggles on the streets. And that what people were calling for, which was the end to oppression, to injustice, to inequality, was necessary for everyone's lives to thrive. Um, and at that moment, many of our um, founding members who come out of um, resource generation that has shaped uh, everyone on this stage, uh, incredible organization that organizes people with wealth in the United States under 35, um, they came out of that kind of analysis of racial capitalism, an analysis of the role of white Christian nationalism and settler, settler colonialism, and were wanting to also not just stay with the analysis, but to begin to redistribute and move wealth in accordance with this um, shared vision for what was possible, and found that there weren't enough vehicles to do that. So Solidaire came into being to experiment with moving money quickly as movement moments arise, not just in the US setting, but globally. And what would it mean to accompany movements by moving quickly, not at the speed of traditional philanthropy, waiting for a proof of concept <laughs> until a movement has become a nonprofit or a social enterprise, but actually moving when we can see that something is really important for a fundamental cultural, political, societal shift. And so that's kind of the origin story and we, we remain true to that in the sense that we found our membership has grown every time we've been relevant and responsive to what's actually true. Even if it's sometimes scary and uncomfortable and not a movement that people's entire families are aligned with. The fact that movements have this capacity to shape the narrative, shape the consciousness of an entire nation and the globe, it feels really important and relevant, especially uh, in my opinion, the next generation of wealth inheritors and people with earned wealth who hold a very cl clear um, understanding that this wealth is not because of their merit. This wealth that they've accumulated is truly based on the exploitation of labor, the dispossession of indigenous peoples from their land, um, and that really the work 
to repair that harm and to redistribute that wealth in the hands of people who've been resisting uh, all of this is, is actually the mandate for our generation. It's also fun. <laughs> it's not only the morally right thing to do, but when you're working deeply in connection with movements, it's a sense of a larger we. And which of us does not want to belong and want to be part of something bigger than our own selves? So that's what sustains that sense of, let's be in the work of movement building together. So as someone who works intimately with individuals and couples and families on helping them to unpack their relationship with wealth, which includes also unpacking the ambivalence about wanting to redistribute wealth, knowing that it's kind of not right to sit on millions and millions of dollars that you don't need, while also being incredibly afraid of losing power, losing security, I feel that the key way that I can help humanize my clients is it's like holding up two mirrors that are both very rigorous and very loving. And one is saying, you are suffering, right? It, it causes immense suffering to have way too much of something. We all can relate to that. It causes suffering to have too much free time, to have too many choices, to overeat, you know, whatever it might be. It causes suffering to be out of balance, to have too much especially in a world where most people are struggling and it separates you from the rest of the world. Mm. And there's also just this strange phenomenon that I see again and again. The moment people inherit wealth, they start feeling more anxious and stressed about money than they've ever felt. And so I mm -hmm. really believe excess wealth causes an immense amount mm. of suffering. Mm. So on the one hand, holding this mirror and saying, look at the ways in which you are suffering. And the more money that you're sitting on, the more you're suffering because the farther you have to fall, and on the other hand, look at how much suffering you, you are also helping to cause by sitting on this money. And if we don't have that second mirror, we're, we're a service that is just catering to the wealthy um, and allowing the wealthy to feel bad about their situation or to, you know, whatever it might be. And if we're only saying, pointing out how much the wealthy are causing suffering, um, we're failing to offer that empathy and that form of connection. Um, so that's one piece. And part of what I also help show my clients is the ways in which we understandably are using money to try to avoid the nature of being human, which is to be insecure. Like we don't actually know what will happen tomorrow. We don't know that we'll have secure housing and food, especially as all these systems are crumbling before us. But those who have extreme wealth can kind of convince themselves that they can control the future which again, just it's, it's misleading and creates a lot of suffering. And so instead, inviting people into acknowledging that insecurity, acknowledging that mm -hmm. lack of control, mm -hmm. the inability to know that your kids will always be safe and secure. And what's more human than that? Mm. And the last piece I'll say of how to help humanize wealth holders is counterintuitive, but it's to offer limits. And this is something I wish all of us could move towards um, offering limits on how much wealth we should have access to as an act of service for our clients mm -hmm. um, instead of helping them to just make and accumulate more and more money. Mm. Mm. Um, I'll say my two piece on this, which is uh, money doesn't solve problems, period, for people in their lives and for movements. It doesn't solve problems. It won't end climate change. It's not going to end war. I think that at the end of the day, this is change work. This is people-based work. And so when I think about donor work, and I think if your goal is how do I unlock money, you've already dehumanized the situation. And we have to think instead, how do I create the conditions for change for people, <laughs> right? Because that's ultimately what redirects the flow of capital is that people have different frameworks they're using. They think differently about themselves in relationship to themselves as well as to other people. I think that sometimes donor work can sort of have an anxiety about the true nature of rich people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're not clear as people who work with rich people, like how do I feel about what are my biases? What are my assumptions? Because when we dehumanize people, we often tend to make strategic choices that are based in assumptions and bias, and we sort of forget to be open and curious about the person across from us. 
And sometimes that bias is they don't really want to do this. If they could give less, they would. Mm -hmm. So my job is to be as coaxing and manipulative as possible, pull you from your true nature exactly. and bring you into a giving process. And I think that we need to stop and figure out, like, do I trust you? Because if not, then we play into all of their fears that they can't trust people. And they've often been taught that, like people who grew up wealthy have ten tended to be taught that you can't trust people because they just want your money. And then guess what? Sometimes that's really true. And sometimes as practitioners, like we can really fall into that trap and forget, like, am I being trustworthy? Right? And so I tend to think about, you know, um, not asking that people give as much as they possibly can, I try to figure out where are you? Let me meet you there. That's what organizing is, right? And if that person is real, if they're stressed out and they've been pushed to the extreme around their giving and they're just sitting there being like, I'm a horrible person, I am not gonna sit there and say, you know how you could be a good person is give more of your money away. Because if you listen to what that person's saying, they're saying, I need my humanity to be reflected for a minute. And then I can get with the program, right? So I think that we have to listen to the things people are trying to tell you about where is their sense of self. Mm -hmm. And if their sense of self is not in what they're doing, then we need to slow down and we need a very different approach. Mm -hmm. Because I think we need to find ways to help people connect with their deeper selves and find their way to interconnection. I don't think we need to manipulate them or like say just the right thing to unlock money, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, which I think, you know, we're having this sort of up here conversation. I want to sort of get into the tactics and the real workable things that you do. Um, so in practice, Iris, um, how do you practice humanizing wealth holders and why is that important in the broader work. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I do is I help my clients imagine, um, what would you do if you lost all of your money tomorrow? You know, who, <coughs> who would you recruit to support you? Um, would you be able to find paid work? How would you feel about the ways in which you're parenting? And how would you also parent differently um, if you couldn't just rely on money and rely on status? And when we go through that imagination exercise, they're able to connect with this deep resilience that we all have. And I, I really feel that excess wealth um, trains us to be kind of fragile and um, very far away from our sense of resilience and adaptability. And I think the key thing, you know, I love the, the opening plenary about climate change and this fundamental need, you know, to go from caterpillar to the butterfly and to be adaptable. That's what's, you know, this moment is calling um, all of us into adaptability and resilience. So part of it is helping people connect with their own resilience, their creativity, and their ability to handle challenges. We don't need this huge buffer of excess wealth to be able to deal with life. Um, and part of it is also pointing out the ways in which, because so much of this is about inheritance, so much of people's core justification for holding on to wealth is about their children, their descendants, the family line. And I think when you leave a massive inheritance to your descendants, you're telling them you don't really trust them. You don't really trust them to figure out life. Um, you feel that you need to kind of manage their lives from the grave, right, through these apparatuses of wealth. Um, and that's not, is that really the message that we want to give to our children and to our descendants? As opposed to offering them concrete life skills. You know, how do you be a good community member? How do you be excellent and impeccable at building relationships and mm. building community? How do you find meaningful work that pays you enough to survive in this volatile economy? And I'll just mention one story. You know, I'll never forget this client of mine um, who had access to about $40 million. And it took us, I don't know, quite a long time to get him to the point of giving away $2 million, which of course is nothing, but for him felt like a huge deal. And I was asking him, why, why not more? You know, what's the problem with giving away 20 million, 30 million? And he started listing off these reasons. You know, what if, what if the stock market crumbles? Um, what if the grid crumbles, <coughs> collapses? What if, what if, what if? And that's something we can all relate to, right? The piece we can't necessarily relate to is to imagine we could have enough money to mm. solve all of those problems. Mm. 
And so part of it is about what if those things happen? What could you lean on other than just money and other than access to wealth to again connect with that sense of resilience? And the last thing is we have to push people to act before they feel completely, totally ready because if we wait until we feel 100% certain about our redistribution, about our divestment, whatever it might be, we will be waiting for a long time. Okay. And action builds confidence. You start giving, you start divesting, and you see that you're still alive to tell the tale. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun, too, to get to give away money, to get to do these powerful, amazing things. And it, it can snowball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the name of anarchy, I just want to respond. Please. That, um, and I did want to queer this conversation just a little bit and say, like, I was always struck by in the resource generation spaces that I was in, which was the first donor organizing spaces, like why are we so queer and trans here? Mm. And I think a lot of it has to do with being able to build mm -hmm. systems of care and support exactly. that create the ability to take a risk mm. financially and also the risk of potentially offending not just your mm -hmm. nuclear family, but your ancestors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Which when ancestry gets conjured in social justice, I don't think they're talking about the hoarding ancestors <laughs> who maybe didn't trust you to earn money, but trusted you to hoard wealth. Yes. And so I think that there's also something about that, like, you know, the, just the way that queers are like, okay, I'm getting surgery tomorrow. Where's my team? Where's my people? It's not about just money's going to create the care you need. And mm. so having the alternative, the ability to build mm -hmm resilience through community building mm. is something very important. And I want us, as a community builder, do you like the tie-in? Um, as a community builder um, in the context where capitalism just and white supremacy keeps us so apart, um, how do you help wealthy people connect um, to multiracial mm. working class movements? How do you help them to partner as collaborators and co-conspirators uh, rather than, you know, the benefactors <laughs> of the movement. Yeah, really appreciating this conversation. And um, yeah, organizing is a skill set like anything else and it can be learned. And when we work with um, our donor members, we consider them not just check writers or givers to the movement, but also as people who are gonna organize their family systems, their institutions, um, their wealth managers, their family offices to actually be more movement aligned and to work for justice all across their portfolios and their giving and their investments. And so um, that work is, deep work and it's re relational work. It's the work of creating um, lots of opportunities for people to come together and to create a community of care, which you, you have so, both of you have so beautifully um, articulated the isolationism mm -hmm. and the perfectionism that so many people who have been raised in great wealth experience. And so to be part of a community where you're invited to bring your children, your puppy, your kittens, your elderly parent, um, to be vulnerable, to actually learn together, that in itself is practice for a lot of people. Really, I'm invited as my whole self. I don't have to show buttoned up. Um, we run solidarity circles, which are peer-to-peer -peer learning circles, and they span um, issues from how much is enough to parenting while being a person of wealth, um, to you know, executive directors of family foundations who have very particular challenges they're dealing with um, that wanna be able to be in a safe space and talk to each other about it. Um, so a whole range of these kinds of solidarity circles aimed at peer learning um, and acknowledging that people's experiences in both managing and moving wealth are very particular and being able to be with others, to be witnessed in that journey um, helps make the journey less lonesome. Um, and then deep political education, um, we really like to center everything we do uh, in what is movement asking of us and what are movement organizations holding us accountable for. And you know, often in philanthropy, as everyone in this room knows, we have uh, no real regulation. We're the, one of the most unregulated industry there is in the world. Um, and so we have to create our own regulatory mechanisms. We have to be able to say to whose benefit 
um, for whose end are we doing this? And how do we keep ourselves pliable? And so at Solidaire, we have various movement advisory committees and oversight committees that actually regularly probe the question, not only where are the resources going, but you say you're a movement aligned base of donors. What does that mean? How, how are we gonna be in relationship with each other, right? And I'll give you a very concrete example. Right now, we're going through a huge new coordinated right-wing attack on some of the bravest, most progressive social justice movements and their donors in the United States. Um, particularly donors that have given to work for Palestinian solidarity, people who have given at unprecedented scales to progressive Jewish and Muslim and Palestinian-led organizations are being um, willfully attacked as anti-Semitic and pro-terrorism using a very well-used authoritarian playbook um, around having a chilling effect on any work that seeks to end an unjust war and to try and poke a hole in this militarization machinery. And these unprecedented attacks are designed to get brave donors to suddenly say, okay, this is, my life is at risk, I'm getting death threats, my family members are questioning my legitimacy in this movement, wedges are being formed. And if there weren't such an incredible amount of support work like what Rai and Iris do every day, as well as what my colleagues do as donor organizers every day, if people didn't feel held and supported in this, move, in this moment, this right wing playbook would be entirely successful. The only reason we're able to preempt and actually build a counteroffensive and to actually strengthen ourselves is by having a mass number of us that are able to both love each other, tend to each other, grieve together, but also build a strategy together and a long-term strategy to counteract these kinds of attacks and to do them, as, as one of my members said in a gathering recently, we must do this not just because we are under attack, we must do this because imagine what the organizations we support, the movement organizations we support, the multiracial working class grassroots communities that we support, what they grow, go through every single day and have, do not have the privilege of, of class, do not have the power that comes with um, wealth to be able to mitigate these threats. And so one of Solidaire's collective giving vehicles is called the Movement Protection Fund. And the Movement Protection Fund really seeks to deploy resources quickly within 24 hours for all of these new digital cyber threats like doxing activists and making, making their addresses known on the web so that people can go attack them. Like this is happening in mass numbers in the US. I'm, I'm sure in the UK as well. I'd love to learn more. Um, and also physical threats as well as one of the greatest ploys always has been litigation, right? Massive. Um, fraudulent like legal threats that tie up really important work um, in, 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 in just mitigating the risks rather than actually having the transformative impact that it's meant to have. So I share all of that to share that um, in this new kind of violence and dehumanization of all forms of peace, security, justice work, globally, it becomes even more important for those of us working with donors and organizing donors to remember that this interconnectedness, this humanizing work, this organizing work, this both tending to the spiritual, emotional, communal side, while also making sure people are sharpening the tools they have access to, becomes even more important. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Y'all are very quiet. I know. Yeah. Can we get some love? If you disagree with us, can you insult us? <laughs> if you like yeah, us, rotten can tomatoes. you yeah. tell um, us you're listening? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Americans, I, we need attention. What can I say? <laughs> Being on a stage under lights is not enough sometimes. <laughs> yes. Can I just add one thing to you? Please. I think that's so brilliant. And one thing that's so unique about creating a donor community as opposed to just a one-on-one -on -one service or one-on-one -on -one relationship is that places like Solidaire, you're able to create a new culture. 
mm -hmm. right? And say, no, 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 the culture of the, the wealthy progressives is we show up in the moment to meet social justice movements, not years later when it's already become acceptable. Um, we're, we dare to give with our names attached. We dare to be the, the, um, the outspoken ones rather than just hiding back. And I think that's something that can really, creating those new norms can only happen in a community, mm -hmm. in a politically aligned community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just, I kind of want to get so practical to a point where we don't tend to get to in some of the donor organizing work because we're often intellectualizing things and we're right up in the in the brain. And, you know, there's a lot of pledges that go unfulfilled mm. in philanthropy. There's a lot of talk and then when it comes time to money actually moving, there's a huge disconnect. And I remember thinking, oh my God, like, the, like rich people, so blah, 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 they're so. Nah, nah, nah. And then when I started coaching people and like working more directly in that spot of the sort of intentions to actions, I realized like for them, it's like they have a to do list mm -hmm. and it's just a thing on their list. Mm -hmm. Like it matters, but it's like I have ADHD. If I had my to do list, in the Chronicle of Philanthropy, it would be embarrassing. <laughs> and so sometimes people just actually need support in that moment of translation between mm -hmm. intention and action, but they don't realize they do. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the unaccountable moment where of course it's privileged to be able to say, well, you can do that and you're fine and everybody else suffers. But we forget sometimes that, well, why are people not doing the things that they say they're going to do and would come up with exceptionalist reasons and explanations as if it's something to do with wealth. And, it, and to some extent it might be, but I think we forget the things that are actually kind of mm. equalizing, which is that it is just hard to follow through with anything <laughs> that we commit to. It's just like we're not being researched always or we're not being studied and we don't have statistics behind it, but there's, yeah. people can be very disappointing. And so I think um, on a practical level, sometimes just offering to body double with someone, like I have one client who I work with who chairs the foundation that I direct and they have ADHD. They have a lot of intentions around what they wanna do. Do they do it? No. Sometimes. <laughs> and so we have body doubling time where we sit together on Zoom and I sit there while they do their giving plan work, mm -hmm. right? And those types of interventions matter. Mm -hmm. I have another client who was like, I just avoid it. And I was like, well, what is giving to you? And it turns out it was a task on the to-do list. I was like, yeah, but what does it mean in your life? And they said, well, it's holy work. Hmm. I was like, well, how do you do things that are holy? And they were like, I do ritual. Hmm. It's like, right, what are you doing when you actually hit send? Mm -hmm when you're giving money. And they said, they go into a catatonic state, mm -hmm. they leave their body, mm -hmm. they conjure up all of this adrenaline, they hit the button and then they go do something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, what would it be like if you mm -hmm. actually gave yourself a moment to mm -hmm. treat this the way that you feel it to be in your life? And they were like, I would light a candle, I would play music, I would bring my loved ones around, mm. right? I would maybe talk about it, right? <laughs> so we're starting to unpack it and sort of put it into the context of actually recognizing that that's a fear response, mm. right? And so a lot of people, like when there's that disconnect, you can sort of count on there is a fear response mm. happening, mm -hmm. right? And so I think just being able to be with people in those moments and be a safe person mm. that you can talk to mm. about the fear without, you know, kind of going into like, like when I say what I do, people are like, oh, it must be so hard to have that problem. Mm. And like you're saying, it's like, yeah, it is sometimes hard yeah. to be a human. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so Iris, I wanna give you, we have a little bit of space for this last question yeah. and then we'll go into your, the final section, but um, I wanna talk about like the bad behaviors, mm -hmm. Um, the being with people in the ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone here have problem. experience with some bad behavior of the wealthy? 
-hmm. we've seen it. Um, so how do you deal with um, oppressive actions, confusions um, that people are holding, and how do you sort of stay connected to their humanity in yeah. those times? Mm -hmm. I think we do people no favors when we, when we tiptoe around them. And um, like what Rai was mentioning, there can be this tendency you know, to tiptoe when people have access to wealth because we kind of want them to do with their money what we want them to do. And we feel that we have to be strategic and careful and cautious. And I think most of us, we can feel when, when someone's being cautious around us. And then when you're raised as wealthy as I was, you're like super tuned in because we're paranoid. We're just paranoid. That's just how it is. And so I think um, giving people very direct feedback is essential and maybe can be daunting at first because most of us are trained into being deferential to the wealthy. Um, I'm very direct with my clients when they do disrespectful things to me. And also when I hear feedback um, from the organizations that they've given to about flakiness, forgetting pledges, being late on pledges, or being micromanaging, I give them feedback. And I think that's a really essential part of my work and all of our work. Because the world would be quite different if all of us gave direct feedback every time someone in a position of power um, was being disrespectful. And part of that means also honoring our own dignity and saying, you know, as a practitioner, I deserve to be respected. My colleagues deserve to be respected. And just because you've inherited this massive windfall of wealth, it doesn't mean you're any different from us. And in fact, I actually need to offer you a little extra support, truly, like not in a condescending way, mm -hmm. of how to be in right relationship with people across class, across power dynamics. Because again, as wealthy people, we have been trained to dominate. We've been, in, we've been trained into being entitled. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many moments I could tell you from my childhood in which it was a very clear message that I was more important than everyone else and I should stomp on everything. So it's an unlearning that we need to support people with. So being super direct, naming the impact, but staying in there with people. And feedback, as you know, it's a gift, right? And it's, it's a step of faith that they can change. When we don't give them feedback, we're sending the message, I don't believe you're capable of changing. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, and now it's my turn. Sure. Great, mm -hmm. yeah. cool. <laughs> Do -do -do. Where am I? I to be. Yeah, sure. So um, let's talk about leadership for a moment. It's another one of those counterintuitive things where we're, we're making a case saying, we need to invest in the leadership of wealthy progressive people, but a different type of leadership, right? So why is it important for us to train the wealthy, wealthy progressive people to be leaders um, when these are people who already have way too much power and in general use power in a, in a very oppressive way? To whoever of you would like to answer. I can go. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of deep listening and learning um, in creating Solidair's 10-year strategy to build progressive power in the United States and to really figure out what is the role of a donor network, what's our strategic lane in building power. It's not just redistribution and moving money for the sake of moving money, but organizing people with access to wealth for what reason? And it's a 10-year strategy. I have copies if anybody really wants to nerd out with me. You should read it. Um, and in that, there's an entire section on building the protagonism and, uh, and the power and leadership of donors. And it surprised a lot of people because years, decades of work in the US has been around helping uh, people with privilege undo their privilege and not be a protagonist in anything. Mm -hmm. And my simple answer to that is, look where we are. How's that worked out? And you know, if, as a student of social movements and as a student of freedom struggles, if we look historically, every movement that has ever been successful in winning its demands has had it at its core, at its and the background, really aligned donors that have been there to support and to be there under conditions of state repression and corporate capture, um, and donors that have been willing to make the flow of resources a generational priority. Even in the US context, it's true about our civil rights movement. It's true about so much. And also, leaving wealth disorganized does not serve society, society as we know it. And you know, in, in terms of the leadership development, it's not only to understand um, our singular role as actors, but it's also to understand collectively 
the structures from which we benefit, such as taxation, right? Philanthropy is a tax evasion mechanism. That's where we come from as an industry, right? If, if there was enough public sector good for all, we wouldn't need private philanthropy to exist. But our industry is based on um, taxation mechanisms that have failed and that have actually prioritized the very wealthy. And so there is a necessity. I truly believe that the only way we're gonna get tax reform in the world is through the leadership of rich people working against their own self-interest. There's, that is true for most public policies in the world. Please, yeah, thank give it up, give it up. And, and if people are undertrained and don't know that there's a political reason, there is an actual social and historical reason by which we have to work against our own self-interest in terms of how the structures are designed to benefit very few at the expense of the majority, then we don't get to the outcomes we want as a society. Simply put, during the pandemic in the US, the, the top 1% amassed a new trillion dollars in wealth. In the meantime, the majority of the country went unemployed with unprecedented levels of poverty and food insecurity that we've ever seen. That is a failure of our public benefit system that's also a fail, it's a, it's a real stark indication of where wealth inequality gets us. And so it becomes really, really important to build leaders and to nurture people's innate leadership capacity to actually undo a system that benefits them. And I'm really heartened, in spite of all of these things that we face, that there's a cadre, there's an incredible growing number of people with both access to wealth, but also people who organize people with wealth, who have joined this larger movement to actually be leaderful, to actually be actors, be in right relationship with movement organizations, and to actually do something to change the circumstance that keeps us all from being truly free. Beautiful. I just want to say one quick thing, um, which is, you know, is my belief that capitalism dehumanizes everyone mm -hmm. in every class level. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, kind of riffing on something Ira said earlier, I do think capitalism requires uh, people with wealth to sort of feel weak and insecure fundamentally. Mm -hmm and look to safety um, in terms of external resources and control, right? And so giving up control, unsafe. Giving money away, unsafe. All these things are, are safety concerns often. And when we're talking about the reasons why, people tend to list, list off like all of these things that would concern their sense, mm. their sense of safety. Um, and so, Donor organizing to me is about differentiating the capitalist self from the true self. Mm -hmm. The capitalist self believes okay. that safety comes from resources. Mm -hmm. The true self knows that safety comes from interdependence. Mm -hmm. We keep each other safe. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's about which self are you empowering, mm -hmm. right? Because people have understandably a gut reaction to thinking about empowerment of donors because they're like, isn't that the problem? Mm -hmm. Don't they already have too much power? Mm -hmm. And the question is, do you feel secure going to your financial advisor and saying, these are my beliefs, this is what I want? Because in my experience, a lot of times donors have um, a certain insecure feeling and are treated badly by people um, who they see as authority figures around when they take a stand mm -hmm. and they say, this is what I want to do, mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes you see this sort of shrinking down, like the advisor said I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. Do you work for them or do yeah. they work for you? And it speaks to a deep insecurity that I think is really normal um, and needs to become normalized to be able to talk about. It's not a failure, it is a systemic problem. Um, so. I want to really think about people who give their wealth away um, and do it very quietly and don't tell anyone about it. I try to say um, that alone will not solve a systemic problem. 
<laughs> because one person being wealthy did not cause catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It's actually from a collective process. The <laughs> systems that created that wealth are still in place if you spend down. What is needed is for everybody to take responsibility um, who has wealth for the collective survival right, of each other and the planet. And you're going to need each other too, right? You're going to be the ones who understand each other and what you're going through, like build those relationships and those connections. And that's all I'll say about that. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. And, um, I'll just do a couple uh, tech notes and then pass it to Vinny to close us. We're going to put up that same poll question that we had at the beginning and just see if anything changed. But please still be honest. Um, so, and as you're doing that, one other thing I forgot to mention at the top of the panel is you are so invited to ask us questions. I really apologize we don't have time to do a Q&A. But if you ask them in the app, we can then see them later and we'll find a way to respond. So please also do that. So um, take a moment and answer. There's two questions at the same time, is that right? Yeah, the same one we asked at the top of the hour and a second one. And then the second one here, do you have faith that we, you know, collectively, all of us, um, have the ability to organize wealthy people into those other roles, those other leadership roles that we were describing. And while people are taking the poll, do you want to tell us about the Action Cafe? Oh yeah, tomorrow there's an Action Cafe. We hope that you will join us <laughs> so that we can put all of these wonderful thoughts into action, into commitments that we hopefully follow through on. Um, no more empty pledges, but really get to be together and imagine how we're going to bring the learnings of this conference into action. <laughs> And on that note, what's an action you want to leave our audience with? You've shared some really important things. Well, look, our percentages went up. Ooh. Wow. OK, the there's still, a, there's still a, a, a group of disbelievers. Let's talk. Come find us. Yes. We want to talk to you. But otherwise, there's many who believe. Great, thank you. Thank you for being part of this work yeah, with thank us. Thank you. What action items do you want to leave us with? I just think. Um, you know, the final thought I have is that people, this is hard work and people can do hard things. Everybody is in a process and the action that I would want to leave people with is to really work against that fawn response. In the, in the fear factory, we have fight, flight, freeze, and we forget about appease, which is the most important one in donor organizing. Mm -hmm. It is where the emperor has no clothes mm -hmm. or just you know, a sock or whatever. <laughs> so, I mean, we have to be able to um, notice in ourselves when we're having a fear response, right? Which tends to create disconnection. Um, mm -hmm. So I think stay connected to yourself, mm -hmm. notice what's going on for you as you work with people with wealth and see if you're coming from a place of fear. That might actually be a place of bonding and a place of connection. That's beautiful. Um, and so I always say work with what you're noticing and try to be someone who's trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Try to relate to people on a human level. Thank you, Rai. Well, Iris. I'll bring in Mike Gast, who I know would want me to say to you to work on your own money story. So what is your own class background? What are your earliest memories of money? And start working on your relationship with money because we can really only bring people as far as we're taking ourselves. So if we aren't constantly exactly doing our right. own money work and healing work around that, oh, I'm seeing the poll, but I'm not, okay, I'm still with you. Um, then we can't, re we're gonna be limited in how far we can take people. So that's for Mike. The one I would offer you is to reflect on what are ways I can start applying limits in my respective role. Mm -hmm. So if you're a financial advisor, really asking yourself, how much money are you actually okay with people having and why? And is it possible to create um, and start informing a really different business model that enforces limits rather than encourages never and mm. never ending um, wealth accumulation. Mm. So reflecting on limits that you can offer in your role. Thank you, Iris. And before I, I say the last word, let us look at that last poll, yes. the results from um, the last poll that shows us that 34% have faith in our ability to organize people and 18% and 36. The majority are kind of like three to four. Mm -hmm. No one said no, so. We'll take that we'll as a yes. That. 
And my last word is don't go at it alone. Yeah. Join something, Amen. anything. Join a group, a community. You don't have to struggle alone in this work. Um, we learn from each other, we grow with each other, and always, always find out what's happening in your local community, in your grassroots groups, and connect your donor organizing to that. Yes. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good job.